Hello and welcome back to another episode of Mind of Steel. This is a classic episode. It's one from the archives. This is Undercover with the Nutters Part 1. It was originally an episode on MC Toon's channel, but this is a, a slightly reduced, edited down version for the short of attention span. That's people like you and me. If you want to watch the original version of this episode, you'll find it on MC Toon's channel. And you could even find a link to the original unedited interview with Mark Steele, which is, uh, whew, it's an absolute treat, as long as you're a Mark Steele completist. For the rest of you, this will perhaps be the most accessible version of the show so far. And also, before we start the show, I have some announcements. Well, first of all, thank you everybody for helping me make it to 13,000 subscribers. Who knew there were that many people who wanted to watch Mark Steele talking about nonsense? Well, there you are, and here you are, and thank you. Announcement two, we now have a Telegram channel. The link to it is at the top of my YouTube channel page, and I'll put a link to it again in the show notes. So if you want to give me some feedback or, or comment or take part in a, a live discussion about Mind of Steel and anything in the UK conspiracy truther universe, you can join on that channel. And the last announcement, well, I shall be performing a live show on the 25th of January, 2024. So if you're in London, and you fancy popping down to The Glitch, which is a, a lovely tiny performance venue uh, near Waterloo Station, well, please do. You, you are cordially invited. Links to tickets will also be in the show notes. And with that out of the way, let's enjoy Undercover with the Nutters, part one. Welcome, uh, Reynard. How are, how are you doing today? Hey, thank you for, for letting me on the show. Um, it's an absolute pleasure. It's, it's been a, this is the culmination of many months of work. <laughs> It is, it is, and, and it's been exciting and so, um, like, tempting to just want to say something and, uh, you know, you just, that would, that would, uh, that would break the cover. So, um, w people don't even know what that is. Could you explain what it is that happened and how you got to where you are? Well, I've been undercover amongst Mark Steele and his friends for the last few months. I, I, they know who I am now. I, I, I recently revealed that I wasn't truly one of them. But for, for the last few months, for most of this summer, I was part of their organization, helping them fight against the perils of 5G uh, in order to learn who they really were. Uh, and it was quite a fascinating, but also stressful few months. And not just because of the lockdown, but to, to keep up this pretense for, for the whole time. Yeah, the, the keeping the facade while talking to them is is really, it's... <clears throat> It's a, it's an exercise in improv, isn't it? Well, yeah. I mean, it, 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 you you have to begin by fully fully accepting their premise, which is that um, not only is five G bad, but the fact that five G is bad and is going to kill us, that's just the the tip of the conspiratorial iceberg. They they operate under a, a sort of you know uh, there is a framework of this sort of conspiracism in, in which. Um, Bill Gates and, and the leaders of, of America and Britain are conspiring under this uh, hideous Agenda 21 to, to do a, a sort of Thanos-type maneuver where uh, a big chunk of the population will be wiped out. And 5G vaccines and a number of other conspiratorially, uh, a number of, of other topics that conspiracy theorists often repeat, these are all parts of that much bigger very frightening agenda and we've talked that that in that it's just basically larping which would be live action role playing and and right that they're they're just they're they're living out this fantasy world that doesn't actually exist these these fantasies serve a, a sort of wish fulfillment for all of these people so we could tell just by the way he behaves and the way he talks that He's not an educated man. He's, he's not an expert. He's not anyone that has any particular knowledge that would make anyone really seek him out for, for, for any topic whatsoever. He has this desire to be looked upon, to, to be the center of attention. And so he has concocted for himself a very elaborate fantasy in which he is the hero. This fantasy creates for him the expertise that he never had. Uh, and he goes around 
telling everyone that he is very expert, uh, a, a weapons systems expert. So, so it really is, it, it really is just fulfilling a lifelong fantasy. And some people become experts through study and a life of hard work. Uh, Mark just decided to, to announce he was one. And uh, <laughs> so he was. <laughs> I really wanted to know about Mark. Is he somebody who is just playing a con on a bunch of dumb rubes? Or is he somebody, is, is there some weirder, deeper pathology going on? And after talking to him for a few months, it, it, my conclusion was that it's, it's the latter. This, this all comes down to Mark's genuine desire to be seen as something other than a boring middle-aged man who, who lives in a suburban neighborhood in a, in a dull, underprivileged, town in northeast england he he doesn't want to be that uh he wants to be something special and this is his road road to stardom back when i first did the thing is he a con man or has he bought his own con and and i i think i think it's definitely the latter because if the true re if the reality of what mark really was became known to mark i just don't think he could handle life you interviewed him you had a series of interviews. Could you explain how that happened? Around March of this year, I became fascinated with this phenomenon. This was seemed to be focused on the UK, where people were burning down cell towers. And this was just at the start of the first lockdown we had in the UK. And, and I started delving into Facebook groups, trying to identify who the ringleaders of, of this movement were. And a few names kept getting mentioned. Uh, you know, I, I kept hearing about a guy called Mark Steele. Everyone said, talk to Mark Steele. He's an expert on 5G. He knows the score. He knows what's really going down. So after a bunch more research, I, I ended up finding the, the Facebook groups where, where Mark Steele operated. This was before he got banned from Facebook, of course. Uh, and eventually the, the WhatsApp groups and all the other sorts of social media channels. But I had no way of, of getting through to him. It was you who provided the, the route. Uh, so this was long before I knew who you were. I became aware that you had done an interview with, with Mark. And I'm sure you'll agree, this was perhaps the most chaotic episode you had ever recorded. <laughs> It was. This was in September. He was going to be on. It was going to be a debate on 5G between myself and Simon Perry. And Simon was hinting that he was going to bring a guest. It turns out Mark was this guest. Boy, what a guest. <laughs> um, people were starting to get very upset with you. They, they, were, they were calling you a, a troll and a Brigade 77 and, and the usual range of insults that you're, you're very familiar yeah. with. Uh, so, so when I say you provided the, 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 the way in, what, what I started doing was trash talking you. I started <laughs> saying things like, um, yeah, we've got to get this guy back. You know, we should give this guy a taste of his own medicine. Let's, let's debunk what Michael Toon is saying. Turns out that was precisely what they wanted to hear because none of, none of these guys seem to have the, the idea of, of actually arguing back. Uh, mustering evidence, forming an argument, structuring that argument in a way that people could understand, that had not yet occurred to these people. And I <laughs> yeah. was the one who was offering to do that. I, I suddenly had access to Mark Steele and I was able to ask him a bunch of questions and more importantly, get the, these, these interviews recorded of which we're about to see a clip. Is what happens, the, the fact that uh, 5G is going to be uh, situated in street furniture, as we know, as a matter of fact, what I want to ask, you know, to try and explain to us, what is the device that's going to be situated in the, in the street furniture? Right. If it's not what we, say, what we say it is, then what is it? So this was the premise under how I got these interviews. We were going to go through each of McToon's claims, and uh, I was going to go to Mark and get the real facts. <laughs> we would prepare our arguments, and 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 Kim was going to Kim was going to edit this this real slam dunk of a of a video that would totally destroy your credibility, and uh, you know you would be ashamed forevermore to show your face on YouTube. Of course. Um... Uh, and uh, and so this this was the, the the goal was to help 
structure and pull together the information. That and, was uh, the proposition. That, that yeah. that's what I had offered to do for them. Yeah. So in this in this clip we just watched, Mark is asking, I guess me, what's going to be in the five G street furniture? If it's not, well, yeah, what he's what issuing he a says. challenge really because he's said that the. Um, I mean, this was, I guess this was late summer, uh, you know, the, the thing that Mark was talking about most was that the threat of what he described as a, a 5G energy weapon installed into British streetlights, so street furniture, that's just a, a, a sort of technical term that we use in England to refer to any kind of sort of stuff made out of metal that you might find by the yeah. sides of streets, like lampposts or park benches, it's all street furniture. And it's... Uh, I guess you know Marx moved on from from this talk now, but back then this this was the that thing was, that yeah. he was fear scanning his his audience about. Uh, and of course, you had already made a, a series of videos by this time, explaining that yeah, the thing in the streetlight is hardly surprisingly just a lighting controller. So so the question to me was, what would be in a five G? cell tower a micro tower nano cell or whatever in a street post and and it would certainly be much larger than this little this little guy here which is a omnidirectional well, I mean, quarter wave uh, it is a street light and you might expect some kind of control system to be present in a street light we've established ad nauseum what the purpose of these devices are probably yeah. not much point in restating that because no. all your old videos provide uh, exquisite proof of what the purpose <laughs> of these devices actually is. I, I guess that that describes the premise. That that was why I was here, but but my purpose was to get to know Mark the man to try and find out, you know, how was this odd creature forged? Where where did he spring from? Who who really is Mark? Well, I think the, you know, one of the things I like to talk about is the misconception of people who have academic qualifications in relation to a number of different scientific uh, uh, sort of uh, spheres. <clears throat> Some of the greatest scientists that have ever been produced um, have identified themselves uh, in the world. You know, Albert Einstein, patent attorney. Uh, Isaac Newton. Uh, Isaac Newton, basically just not, just a, 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 a sort of a, a guy who had a lot of time on his hands, or the uh, you know right. uh, Marconi, or uh, the greatest scientist that ever was produced out of the United Kingdom was Michael Faraday. Michael Faraday had no academic background. Okay, uh, so so you're kind of like those guys. That's you, you know a, a no, gentleman no, no, scientist. I'm not as it no, no, I'm not. No? Okay. I've got a mechanical engineering background. I'm a material sign uh, expert. So fatigue mechanics was my expertise. So I had asked Mark, why should people listen to you? I mean, what's your qualification? And instead of admitting that, well, he, he has nothing other than a psychology degree that he obtained whilst in prison, he, uh, he went on uh, this, this bizarre spiel comparing himself to the greatest minds of the scientific enlightenment. In Mark's own fantasy universe, he is equivalent to, to Michael Faraday, plus he has some qualification in materials engineering. Uh, from what I can tell, he did some sort of low-grade technical work as a, uh, as a technician in a material science laboratory, which I don't think that puts him on the same scale as Isaac Newton. No, it's not. Certainly, some of these people did not have educational background, but what they did produce made sense and was reviewed by the other people that did have an academic background. And they had discussions and it was, uh, you know. Mark has misunderstood the historical context of, of, of these great scientists. Absolutely. So they may not have been through a modern university undergraduate process followed by a postgraduate research process that, that didn't exist in the, uh, in the Enlightenment. Uh, Isaac Newton had been a student all his life and uh, was somebody you know, renowned as a mathematician and a, and a, you know, a, a polymath. He's comparing himself 
with people who are literally the greatest scientific minds that the United Kingdom has ever produced. It, I really had to, 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 to bite my tongue to, to avoid laughter. Um, because we're talking about a man who's, who's done nothing, really, except make a bunch of wild claims on YouTube. This is not equivalent to the man who invented calculus or, no. or, or the guy who, who, who built the foundations of our understanding of how, how radio signaling works. These, these, these things are, are not even remotely in the same category. Yeah. Uh, should we watch the next one here? Yeah. Why were you chosen for this job? His basic uh, engineering uh, background, uh, and obviously I went off to this uh, facility uh, that's covered on the USA, so I can't speak about this. Uh, and obviously at that facility, I understood that the non-ion, non-ionizing radiation spectrum was not what would be expected in the let's say the basic physical uh, realm. So, you know, the basic physics says there's none of energy in that part of the spectrum. That's absolute bunk. Mark makes a very big deal about the fact that he's a weapons systems expert. So I, I asked him, you know, wh- why, were, why were you selected for this, this job? And as you can see, he, he gave this very vague answer indeed. If we actually consider Mark's history, uh, the, the time when this could have taken place is a, is a very narrow tranche of time. He, as we all know, he was arrested in 1993 for the accidental shooting of a, of a woman whilst he was working as a, a sir in a, in a pub in, in uh, Tyneside somewhere. He would have been in his early 30s when he was arrested. I think he was 33 or 32 back then. Yeah, that so sounds about right, yeah. Th- there's no way he would have been employed by, by any MOD facility after he'd had a criminal record. So this must have taken place before 1992, when he would have been in his late 20s or uh, very early 30s, at which time he didn't have any qualification. He, he basically had some kind of apprenticeship, from what we can tell. There is absolutely no way he would have been put in a position of academic or scientific responsibility with that kind of background. Yeah, and maybe if he had spent another couple decades in the industry, he could have risen to the point of being an expert in these things, but not at the age of 32, Yeah, not in his, his late 20s or his very early 30s. You potentially could, without an education, rise to that level. In 1993, he was described in the newspaper article as a fitter and a part-time bouncer. Yeah, so a fitter, that's British term for somebody who is a technician who works within a company. So, for example, uh, if you were a plumber who worked within a gas works, rather than being called a plumber, you might be called a, a fitter. It's clear from all of the press about Mark and, and what he's saying about himself that he is not, at that time, a technical person, nor really has he ever been. Yeah, because after being in prison for uh, you know four to eight years, whatever it was, he wouldn't have been brought into a, you said, MOD, a Ministry of Defense position. Well, there's so, absolutely no way somebody with uh, a, a criminal record, there have been newspaper articles by this time describing him as a paranoid person. There's no way that such a person would be trusted with the, the secrets of the realm. He sees himself as a kind of uh, visionary inventor. So, so that's why, as you can see from the next clip, he, he sort of had to um, manufacture th- this history for himself. Uh, prior to, uh, obviously, some of the uh, earlier products, uh, I, had, I invented the ear, uh, ear exit and tool, ear molecular reactor for this. So hold on, whoa, whoa, you have to slow down. Say, say that again, but slower, please. An exit and tool. An exiting tool, did you say? Tool. Uh, like... It's a tool for exiting. Uh, 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 it's for it's for actually uh, breaking into uh, the appear zone uh, in the oil and gas industry. So an exiting tool. You call them exiting tools where they chop a hole through the, you know, through the tubular into the appear zone. So I asked Mark to describe some of his inventions, uh, and, and this was the first one he, he mentioned. Uh, I had literally no idea what he was talking about. So I did have to consult some friends. Um, 
what he was saying as pie zone, I think he means pay zone, which is a term from from the oil and gas industry referring to the the region of an oil field that is um, economically viable for extraction. And I think by uh, exiting tool, what he really means is extraction tool, that uh, it, it would be some some device used in the mining industry to extract a mineral resource from a pay zone. But my impression when he was talking was, uh, this is a guy who's never actually invented anything. What he's done is he's perhaps had a job in an oil or a gas company of which there are many in, in that region. Perhaps he was doing some kind of low end fitter type job and he overheard these words being spoken and he's sort of repeating these words back to me without really understanding what they mean. And it, it's very easy when, when somebody blasts you with a word salad of, of jargon, you know, our, our normal human instinct is to say, well, I don't understand that. Maybe it's true. And we don't go and yeah. check, which was the, this is, this is why I needed to have Mark on video so I could actually take apart what he was saying a sentence at a time and, and, and come to my own conclusions. My, and my conclusion here is he has absolutely no idea what he's talking about. Well, and to add to that, again, if he was such a high profile inventor, why in 1993 was he just a fitter and a part time bouncer? What happened and, and what part of be working in this particular industry makes him an expert in weapon systems? So that must have been yet a different segment of the 13 to 15 years between when he would have finished his main education and when he, uh, in 1993, when he was arrested, right? So my understanding of is that he's just a guy who probably worked in some kind of factory that serviced the old oil and gas industry, and he heard some words. I even searched every single patent associated with his name. I found one patent that was related to a, a helmet product made by his brother's company. He's just making stuff up to try and impress me and Kim. For Kim, I don't think he needed to, to try very hard. And, and I was pretending to be impressed, which is why he kept talking, which, <laughs> which leads me on to his, his next invention, which totally blew my mind. So can you talk about what research was done while you were the director of Dark Team? Well, research, we used to research a number of different uh, product developments. Uh, so let's say a, a carbon, carbon cracker. A carbon cracker. So is that, is that something? Just a molecular, a molecular reactor technology. I've always been, you know, I've always been an inventor. I'm, I'm familiar inventor. with hydrocarbon cracking, but I mean, that's something that's obviously been existed since the, like the, the 40s. But um, do you, so you, you invented a specific kind of cracking system, did you? Or? I invented a specific carbon cracker that was be, would be fitted into a flute that disassociates the molecular bond between CO2. So it would, it would break down CO2 into what? Carbon and oxygen. And this was absolutely fascinating to me. Mark has invented, he's basically invented the tree. He's invented a machine which can, can extract carbon dioxide from the atmosphere and, and turn it into captured carbon and, and oxygen. Um, um, if true, absolutely amazing Nobel Prize winning stuff. Now, uh, I, once again, I have no background in the chemicals industry. So I had to check with, with people who are more, more knowledgeable about me. Uh, 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 the answer was, whilst it is entirely possible to make a, a chemical process that separates carbon... Uh, Disassociates into, the bonds. Um, this is, yes, th th this could be done. Um, you would be fighting against the laws of entropy uh, and you would end up putting more energy into this process than, than uh, the, the, you may have got in the first place. So you, what would you be? You, would you be burning hydrocarbons to uh, to capture car hydrocarbons? It, it, it would not make any sense. So my my impression of what's gone on here is Mark has once again conflated a bunch of concepts in his head. He's he has confused carbon capture, which is the idea of capturing waste CO two from an exhaust process, and hydrocarbon cracking, which is the process of taking a a complicated uh, hydrocarbon big, yeah, big and molecule. splitting it into simpler hydrocarbons. So that's th these are things that would have 
that there would have been factories around that area that, that were involved with both of these sorts of things. So he, he may have heard these words and, and simply um, conflated them. He's just saying stuff to impress us right now. But once again, we checked his list of patents. There is absolutely nothing on his list of inventions that is remotely like this, even if this were a, a, a physical plausibility, which it isn't. Mark has uh, an, a very interesting story I found. Uh, I just love it on on this this prize he won. Could you kind of introduce that a little? I, I wanted Mark to, to talk a bit more about why he should be regarded as a weapons expert. When I asked him this, I was expecting him to talk about his industry experience. But instead, he, he, he started talking about something from, from high school. The fact that I was always interested in weapons systems. Mm -hmm. When I was 11 year old, uh, you know, I was basically the, uh, let's say, the, uh, the, the cleverest guy in the school. And I won an award to uh, to get uh, a, uh, let's see an award for obviously being top of the class. And I was 11 year old. I went to a bookshop in Newcastle called Thorns. I was given a, a voucher. It was about seven pound at the time. That was quite a lot of money. Um, it was talking about uh, you know. I was 11 year old at the time, so I was, uh, you know, you were talking about uh, 71, because uh, I was born in 1960. And I went to uh, Thorne's Bookshop in Newcastle with the deputy head, a guy called Morris Mears. And I remember it quite, uh, quite interesting, because they give us this voucher to buy some books. The books I bought at Thorne's Bookshop were about intercontinental the intercontinental 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 the intercontinental the intergalactic planetary intercontinental uh, ballistic missiles okay. and uh, small arms so obviously they have to present me that uh, at the uh, you know this award ceremony uh, before I left to go to the uh, senior school so I've always had an interest in weapon systems ever since I was a very, very young child in a very, very perverse way. So I understood about the uh, secret uh, weapon systems, you know, Hitler's secret weapons uh, systems. And, you know, and I knew about uh, Operation Paperclip because I've always had an interest in weapons, you know, all, all the way through uh, my uh, junior years and senior years. I used to write the weapons uh, product uh, developers across the world to ascertain their latest and greatest uh, weapon system. So I knew quite a bit about weapons for some inexplicable reason. Mark thinks he's a weapons expert because as a kid, I just want to understand that as a kid, he wrote letters to weapons designers. Yeah, basically. So in this, in this clip, he's describing what may be the pinnacle of his academic achievement by my guess, this would have taken place in the late 70s or possibly early 80s when he, he would have been uh, maybe 16 years old, about to leave uh, his secondary school and go on to do maybe A-levels, which we think he may have done. Oh dear, uh, I promised you an erratum interlude and this is it. Well, I made a terrible mistake. I said that Mark Steele probably did A-levels. Oh, later on, I learned that he definitely did not. Mark Steele's highest academic achievement at school was his CSE exams, and that was the examination intended for less academic students. Mark Steele took his CSE, as far as we can tell, he did not do particularly well, and he left school at 16 to pursue an apprenticeship in welding. There you go, that was your correction. Uh, now, on with the rest of the show, but remember, please stick around for those last minute announcements. You, you, you'll hear uh, just some more interesting information that may be of use to dedicated Mind of Steel viewers. He, he's a, he's, he considers himself to be a weapons systems expert because he read a bunch of books about cruise missiles and small arms and, and wrote letters 
as to weapons companies. That, that's it. That is the sum total of it. Other people might say they're an expert because they have studied these, these things academically. They've des designed these things or possibly you know, they, they've had a lifetime or, career or maybe for, actually, for arms companies. Maybe actually developed one. That'd be another. Mm. So, so this is this is the source of Mark's expertise. We we cannot find any record of Mark actually ever having worked in weapons design or manufacture. This is and the it, only connection. Of course, he will say that he did, and it's covered under the OSA. Right, but but if, even if he even if that were the case, I think Mark could talk about some of the principles by which weapons are made or, or, or operate, but he never seems to talk about that sort of thing. He, 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 the way he speaks is consistent with a guy who's read a bunch of books and probably spends a little bit too much time watching History Channel. That was part one of Undercover with the Nutters. We learnt a great deal about Mark Steele's school days, his early life leading up to the Mark Steele we know today. Uh, there are two more parts of this show, and you can see them both on MC Toon's channel right now in their original unedited form. You can also find links to the absolutely unedited, the, the, the three hours of interviews with Mark Steele himself. And you can find that also linked to from MC Toon's channel. But if you want to stick around here, I shall provide uh, edited, shorter versions of those interviews on this channel. That, and that's if you're a uh, short attention span kind of person, I would urge you to stick around here and enjoy what's coming. And please don't forget to join the Telegram channel. The link is right at the top of my YouTube page. Also consider getting a ticket to see me live at The Glitch, that delightful performance space near Waterloo Station. On the 25th of January, I shall be performing some improvised comedy with my talented, fabulous improviser friends. It's a two hour show. It, it's actually free, but you're welcome to pay a bit of money if you want to support the gig and the venue. Ah, oh, it's been exciting. It's been such a blast, and I hope to see some of you on the 25th. And the rest of you, please rejoin me in one week's time for another exciting episode of Mind of Steel. <laughs>